Okay. Good morning or good afternoon on, on some, but not all of your ends. Very delighted to talk to you today about process tracing. Um, let me uh, give you a brief outline of what I'm going to do here, and then I'll jump right into it. So the, the five main sections of the talk are first, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time giving you my motivation for doing process tracing, because it's it's not immediately obvious to me, and hopefully not to you either, why one would do process tracing in a discipline that clearly favors people doing experimental work or work based on a research design that is meant to emulate the the consequences of random assignment. Um, after giving you reasons to want to do something like process tracing, I'm going to present the first critique of case study research, because for a long time, people who weren't doing case study research were very critical of the very idea, why would you do this? It can't possibly work. So I'll present that critique. And then I'm going to give you something for reasons that will become clear. I'm going to call the detective model of inference. And that's the basic model of inference that underlies all forms of process tracing. And I'm going to explain to you why I think the detective model of inference is a perfectly adequate response to the first critique. And so then we'll spend a lot of time on part three. We'll walk through the model of inference. We'll walk through various forms of process tracing, give you an overview of that. The problem is there's a second critique. There's a second critique of the sort of work that we're doing when we do process tracing and other forms of observational research. And I don't think that the detective model of inference does double duty. The detective model of inference is a reasonable response to the first critique, but it is not a reasonable response to the second critique. And because I take that second critique very seriously, the last part of the of the talk today, part five, will be what I've called here qualitative causal inference. That is uh, the title of a of a book manuscript that I it is nearing completion, and I will explain to you how I want to extend the detective model of inference so it responds to the first critique and to the second. All right, so let's get right into it. Why would one do process tracing if one could do experiments or regression discontinuity designs or difference in difference estimators and so on and so forth? Well. I'm hoping that you're familiar with at least some of the works on this list. This is a burgeoning literature. These are, I think, the, the top group of people writing on it that tries to explain why over the medieval period into the early modern period, the Middle East, quote unquote, fell behind Europe. The idea that somewhere around the year 1000 relative to, to Europe, the Middle East was wealthier, had enlightened forms of government, was uh, many centers of scientific research and, and so on. But over the next eight centuries, the Middle East clearly fell behind. Um, so here's the books. We won't talk about any of their specifics. We'll just say they're very thoughtful, theoretically innovative and interesting. And many of them use some version of a research design that would fall under the rubric of, of uh, causal inference or identification or sometimes called the credibility revolution, et cetera. Um, here's what they all have in common. All right? They have different arguments about how the Middle East fell behind, but they all start with the antecedent conditions. They all describe something called the golden age of Islam. Um, they then spend some time focusing on a critical juncture, which is a moment at which uh, the Middle East adopted a set of institutions that were suboptimal from the perspective of long-term development, or in some cases, existing institutions that had been optimal under earlier conditions became suboptimal under um, new conditions. That's the critical juncture. And then there's a long-term le legacy, uh, a path-dependent reproduction of suboptimal outcomes such that once the Middle East gets on this suboptimal path, it cannot move off of it. And it stays there for century after century after century until everyone wakes up in 1800 and says, oh, it's a brand new world. Europe has taken taken over, et cetera. An important point is that everyone who writes about this thinks that the path dependent reproduction of suboptimal outcomes, relative poverty compared to Europe, authoritarianism, political violence, you name it, it's been attributed to this historical legacy. It's always assumed to continue into the contemporary period. And so, although we might think that any medieval Islamic institutions, however we describe them, um, ended somewhere in the 19th century, 
that's that's not denied by this group of people, but they still think the legacy continues. Well, why is that a problem and why am I using this to motivate process tracing? Suppose these institutions they point to as being suboptimal. Suppose they explain why the Middle East was less developed, however you wanted to find that, in the year 1800. We know, and everyone has to admit, that these medieval political and economic institutions do not persist into the late 20th, early 21st century. They simply do not, right? So um, uh, uh, Lisa Blaze and Eric Cheney, to give you one example, they write about Mamluks. Well, Mamluks don't exist anywhere in the Middle East after the year roughly 1812, when I, I assume you all know the history, Muhammad Ali in Egypt gathers them all in the citadel and slaughters them. So clearly that institution doesn't exist anymore. What I think all these works have in common is that they uniformly ignore or discount a period of mass discontinuity. And we could describe that discontinuity in numerous ways. Here's a short list, and you can see how momentous these events are. The Ottoman Tanzimat reforms of the mid-19th century, European colonialism into the 20th century, nationalist struggles for independence, the rise of populist authoritarian regimes. None of these things play any role in these, these books. And I, I would almost encourage you to go back and see how they're constructed. There'll be often lengthy books or dense articles that take you to the year, well, let's call it 1850. Then they stop. And then maybe they have a paragraph about how to bridge between 1850 and 1990. And then they go on and say, and here's how all the bad things come out in the 1990s. So at minimum, there's just this enormous gap in the historical record papered over by the claim of causal continuity. That's my approach to process tracing. That's not everyone's approach to process tracing. You can read other people and we'll give you different rationales, but my rationale for process tracing, what has led me to think about it for over two decades now, is that we cannot simply assume that historical causes operate continuously over time. We have to have some way of theorizing and then empirically demonstrating that a causal process operates without major discontinuities. And if you want a definition of a major discontinuity, well, if you ignore the Tanzimat colonialism, World War I, World War II, nationalist movement, struggles for independence, and so on and so forth, I think we can all agree informally as a friendly group that that constitutes a major discontinuity. So this next point becomes important for what I'm going to do later in the talk. My commitment to qualitative methods of process tracing is based on my belief that that we can use it as an effort to trace the continuity of causal propagation throughout a hypothesized causal process. Take a moment and think about a physical process of causation, and we would expect that some forms of causal propagation to move continuously across time and space, connecting in a very physical way cause and outcome. And if you want to talk to me about quantum mechanics, we can do that later on and why there are exceptions to this claim at the quantum level. But hopefully we don't feel the need to go into that. Again, this is not the only interpretation and the only justification of process tracing, but it's one that motivates me and perhaps motivates you as well. Why I use this example of the medieval origins of the supposed backwardness of the Middle East. Okay. What is process tracing then? Here's, I think, an excellent definition from some work by Andy Bennett and Jeffrey Checkle. It's an edited volume and their introduction to it. I gave you a chapter of mine in that book. Um, Andy Bennett has been one of the foremost uh, advocates and developers of process tracing. It's the analysis of evidence on processes, sequences, and conjunctures of events within a case for the purpose of either developing or testing hypotheses about causal mechanisms that might causally explain the case. Um, uh, for our purposes, what we want to focus on here is the idea of within a case. Every, all of the evidence, all of the testing of hypotheses, all of the probing of explanations, all of the conclusions are drawn from a single case, however we define that case. Process tracing does not deny that one can make inferences across cases, but process tracing is a method that is that is calibrated to making inferences from within a case. Now, the fact that you're going to do case study research, and this is part two of the talk, opens you up to what's often called the small n critique. And the small n critique is the claim that 
case study research is a poor way of learning about the world because in any case studies, there will be too many variables and too few observations, right? So we conventionally use N to index the number of observations, which here are understood as being the rows in your data set, every row being an observation. And we're drawing here on some the basic mathematical idea that if, if you want to solve a system of equations, you cannot have more unknowns than you have equations, right? So if I say to you x plus 5 equals 10, you can easily figure out that x equals 5 one unknown, one equation. But if I say to you x plus five equals y, there's actually an infinite number of solutions to this. For every possible value of y, there's a value of x, right? Graphically, and I like to think of these things graphically, if you have a two-dimensional grid, x-axis, y-axis, you put exactly one point in there, you can draw an infinite number of lines with an infinite number of slope coefficients through that point. And that's this. This is a critique that's been around in, in that I'm aware of since the 1970s. Although I don't doubt that somebody has made that critique earlier on. Very little in the 20th century was brand new. Someone in the 19th century figured it out. So, how did process tracing get off the ground and become such a widespread and accepted? methodology, given that there's this well-known critique that seems pretty seamless. You can't draw any inferences when your n equals one. And the answer is that the inferences are not based on the analysis of covariance. The small n critique presumes statistical inference, and statistical inference is obviously a very important way to go about doing things in your work, in your life, and in, in all, you know, in, in your and everything you can imagine. Um, the evidence in a case study is not organized into a rectangular data set. And we are not trying to draw inferences by thinking about the structure of covariance or correlation or a regression coefficient between X and Y. Instead, the key idea is that we leverage diverse and non-standardized pieces of evidence to confirm a hypothesis and attempt to refute its rivals. And non-standardized is important here, right? If you have a data set, that means for every variable, you've operationalized it, you've told us how you're gonna measure it, you measure consistently. There's a standardization imposed on the observations, but in a case study, evidence could be anything. You might have an archival document here, you might have an interview there, you might have some primary historical documents there, you might have some statistics at some point along the line. This idea that we leverage non-standardized pieces of diverse evidence to probe the validity of different hypotheses in a, uh, a mode of inference that is not based on covariance. Well, we have to give it a name. What is this model of inference? I like to call it the detective model of inference. And the reason I like to call it the detective model of inference is because if you read enough about process tracing, and I, I did check one of the, the reading by Andy Bennett that I suggested to you for today uses this exact quote. The fictional detective Sherlock Holmes famously said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So think of the classic murder mystery. And I, I assume this is a widespread genre, but if it, if it doesn't immediately make sense to you, then I apologize for using a, a genre that makes sense to me, but not necessarily to everyone. But in the classic murder mystery, the detective begins with a fixed set of suspects. And it actually becomes very important that there's a fixed set of suspects. So if you ever have gone back to read classic murder mysteries, whodunits, they always take place in a setting where there's a fixed number of suspects. They, you know, the, the, the classic, there's a movie out recently called Murder on the Orient Express. A murder takes place on a train that's been snowed in by an avalanche. The murderer has to be on the train. There's no other possibility, right? So given a fixed set of evidence, the detective is in a sequential manner going to discover new pieces of evidence and each piece of evidence will allow the detective to eliminate another suspect. And the basic idea in, in the literature on, uh, on uh, inductive inference is called eliminative induction. Begin with N suspects, 
reject n minus one suspect, you have no other choice but to believe that the nth su suspect must be guilty or that the nth hypothesis must be true because it's the only one that hasn't been eliminated. So therefore, we can think of process tracing as one way of working within the detective model of inference where you use multiple inferences using diverse evidence which in the aggregate support one hypothesis relative to its rivals, subject to two constraints. One is the availability of evidence. I, I, I don't know what evidence is gonna be available for you and you might not be able to do all of this, right? The method gives you a procedure to follow. It doesn't guarantee success. So one constraint is the availability of evidence and the other is complete knowledge of the set of relevant hypotheses. And you can see why that's true. If the idea is you're gonna begin with n suspects, reject n minus one, and then give all your confidence to the nth hypothesis, there cannot be an nth plus one out there for this model to work. Now, in practice, we don't worry about that too much, but if you read the texts on process tracing, they're all going to tell you, um, cast your net broadly, make sure you have the largest possible set of alternative hypotheses. And in one of the more ingenious and important innovations that we'll see in the next few years, Jay Seawright is working on how to use machine learning to help us expand and completely populate the set of alternative hypotheses so that we don't make a mistake simply because we've ignored one of the suspects. All right, so what's the general logic of process tracing? It's, it's really not that difficult. Once we get past a small end critique, you can imagine what we're going to do. We derive the empirical implications of a hypothesis under the assumption that the hypothesis is true, right? It's just an initial assumption. We say, if my hypothesis is true, what should I observe in the world? Right? Those are the implications, their predictions, and they're the basis of our hypotheses test. And note that the claim, what should I observe in the world, really can be read both as what should I actually observe, but what should I not observe? What types of evidence are inconsistent with my hypothesis? So we have a, a list of observations um, that we're going to use to test a hypothesis. If an observation cannot be made, again, subject to constraints on accessibility of evidence, right? the absence of Evidence is not the same thing of, of evidence of absence, after all. The hypothesis fails the test. If I say, if your hypothesis were true, we would have to observe something. We've tried hard. We've not observed it. Then by simple logic, uh, since the observation was the condition for that hypothesis being considered true, the hypothesis fails the test. And in some instances, we might conclude that failing a single test falsifies the hypothesis entirely. On the other hand, if we do make the observation, your hypothesis says, if my, if my hypothesis is true, I should observe something. We observe it, but that observation might be equally or partially consistent with other hypotheses as well. If that's the case, then the fact that you pass the hypothesis test doesn't necessarily give a lot of credibility to the hypothesis because it is consistent with other hypotheses as well. Therefore, the final point here that is that evidence that is uniquely consistent with one and only one hypothesis give, can provide strong reasons to confirm that hypothesis. So here's, in a nutshell, three different ways that we can think about the relationship of an observation to a hypothesis test, and hence to our judgment about the hypothesis. We can't make the observation. We can make the observation, but it's not unique. And we can make the observation, and it is unique to our hypothesis. A classic table, and this is really the essence of what we might call classic process tracing or orthodox process tracing. Notice that the column and the the, 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 the columns in the rows are defined by being either necessary for affirming causal inference or sufficient for affirming causal inference. You can, we have yes and no on either one. And then, and then the, the chart, this is really a you know, packed with information and worth your studying later. Um, 
I didn't provide the citation for it, but I can easily do that at the end. I can email it to all of you. We have the implications if you pass the test, the implications if you if your hypothesis fails the test, and then the implications for the rival hypotheses. Well, I want to just talk about the main diagonal, number two and number three, um, because numbers one and four are just combinations of two and three, really. And, and quite frankly, most of the work takes place in the realm of either a hoop test or a smoking gun test. So let's spend a few minutes speaking about each test um, and what it means to pass the test, what it means to fail the test, and what are the implications for the alternative hypotheses. And again, this is a very classic notion of, of um, process tracing, and we'll complicate things a little bit after this. So a hoop test is a test that we consider to be necessary, but not sufficient for causal inference. Why would a test be necessary but not sufficient? I, I don't mind the language of necessity and sufficiency. It tells us what conclusions to draw, but it doesn't tell us what makes a hypothesis necessary and or sufficient. So the idea is that in a hoop test, the implications of a hypothesis are certain, but not unique. By certain, we're saying, by golly, if your hypothesis were, if we're supposed to consider your hypothesis true, you had better be able to make these observations or else. But if you make it, they're not unique to this hypothesis. Other hypotheses predict this, right? So certainty means the evidence must be observed. The non-uniqueness means if observed, the evidence is consistent with more than one hypothesis. So in keeping with uh, the idea of a detective model of inference and the murder mystery. And for the record, this is how these tests are discussed in the literature. This example, I've just changed the names, but this example is in the early texts. If Ellen murdered David, she must have been in the vicinity of the crime at the time it occurred. That seems to be to be an absolutely certain implication if she were not in this vicinity, she could not have directly murdered David. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking she could have hired someone to murder David. Ellen has access to all sorts of resources like that. But notice, that's just a claim about how certain is this implication of the hypothesis. So we're just going to make it as the hypothesis is not that Ellen hired someone, but that she was directly responsible for the crime. So now we have this hypothesis. Now we have an observable implication. If the evidence is that she was not in the vicinity, the hypothesis fails the test and is rejected. That seems pretty clear. If she wasn't there, she could not have committed the physical act of murder. But right. So if you fail a hoop test, again, certainty but non-uniqueness, if you fail it, the hypothesis is rejected. But what if Ellen was in the vicinity? Well, let's assume that there were other suspects in the vicinity also. Then passing the test does not confirm the hypothesis because other suspects who were in the vicinity could also have been the murderer. And therefore, this evidence is consistent with other hypotheses. Now, that's, of course, just kind of fanciful, clearly fictitious. But think about it. If you say X is a cause of Y, what is a hoop test? There must be a bivariate correlation of X and Y. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, I can imagine circumstances in which that's not true, I'll say I agree with you. We could question the idea of certainty here, right? Maybe, maybe, there, is, maybe there are special circumstances, but let's not complicate things too much. We want to understand the basic point. If we don't see the bivariate correlation between X and Y, then under most circumstances, we're going to say X could not have been a cause of Y. You can come back and talk to me about measurement error. You can talk to me about unique circumstances in which X is a cause of Y, but X and Y won't be correlated. I can imagine a few odd circumstances. You're all creative people, I can imagine too. On the other hand, if you have a bivariate correlation between X and Y, nobody says we're done, X cause Y. So that's that's just a way of thinking about standard practices in terms of a hoop test. So this, in some sense, is nothing new there. It's just that we're not using the logic of statistical inference. Here's another way for you to think about hoop tests. 
And I'm doing it this way to prepare you for where we're going to go next, which is to dip our toes briefly into the frigid waters of Bayesian inference. The basic logic of hoop test does not require what I wrote here, but I find it helpful to say this. Let's force you to write down your prior belief in the hypothesis before you look at the evidence. And let's, for the sake of easy argument, say that you give the probability that the hypothesis is true a, a, a probability of 0.5 because it's basically a coin flip to you. And that's before you've looked at the evidence. If after you have a failed hoop test, then you have to update that probability. So we get the conditional probability, the probability that the hypothesis is true, given the evidence now should be going towards zero. Maybe it isn't zero. Maybe we, 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 we move down to 0.1 or 0.05 because you can imagine some special circumstances. But the point is we're going to, that our posterior probability is going to be lower than our prior probability. What happens if you pass the hoop test? Well, technically speaking, because the hoop test is, does not have the quality of uniqueness, your posterior probability should be approximately the same as your prior probability. This is, I think, something about which we can have some discussion. I might want to say, okay, you have evidence consistent with your hypothesis, but it's consistent with all those other hypotheses as well. Why do we think this matters? that your posterior probability should remain exactly the same at 0.5. You might counter, look, I exposed my hypothesis to a test. It could have been proved wrong. It wasn't. You have to allow that that gives us at least some increment of increased confidence. I don't think we need to debate that very much, but you can see how we think about that. Notice that it's not entirely clear what the implications are for the alternative hypotheses, right? If you fail the test, presumably that makes the other hypotheses somewhat more credible, but we don't have a formal way yet of describing how we think about that. And if you pass the hoop test, it's not really clear what to say about the other hypotheses as well. So we're starting to see a few limitations of the orthodox view of process tracing. And again, this is to help you understand why people have gotten very excited about the transition to Bayesian analysis. Smoking gun test is somewhat the, 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 the obverse. It's a, a test that we consider to be sufficient, but not necessary. It's sufficient because the evidence is unique to that hypothesis, but it's not necessary because if we don't observe that evidence, the hypothesis might still be true. So imagine a videotape recording of Ellen murdering David. I think we're all gonna agree that this is sufficient to incriminate Ellen. Right, Because that hypothesis really doesn't seem to be, that evidence doesn't seem to be consistent with any other hypothesis other than the fact that Ellen has homicidal intent and acted upon it. But what if we don't have that evidence? The fact of the matter is no one is exonerated from a crime um, because we say we don't have a videotape recording of you committing that crime. Right, It's not a necessary implication of the hypothesis. Right, So if you fail the test, if you don't find smoking gun evidence, well, we just say, okay, let's move on and look at other things. But if you pass it, you're going to be kind of tempted to say, okay, we're done. Um, um, and so on. Um, uh, and again, think about the bivariate correlation. The bivariate correlation between X and Y would not be smoking gun evidence. It would not be sufficient to consider X a cause of Y, because it's still consistent with other hypotheses about endogeneity, about con confounding variables, pardon the typo there, I was confounded by the word confounding and misspelled it and so on. Um, on the other hand, think about it for a moment. I do want to draw, draw, draw uh, an analogies and parallels to other methods. A statistically significant, significant difference of means test on the results of a randomly controlled trial would, I think, be considered a, a smoking gun test um, because it's sufficient to confirm that X is a cause of Y in this study because the experimental design simultaneously rules out, at least in principle, other sources of bias. If you have random assignment to treatment, then in principle, no confounding variables can affect assignment. 
if you assign people to treatment and control, manipulate treatment and control, and then measure the effect, you can't have endogeneity and so on. We all know that experiments you know, don't always follow the ideal script, but you see why we might think of the experiment as a smoking gun test. So to, 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 to pave the way towards Bayesianism, again, we'll start with our prior belief before seeing evidence that the probability of the hypothesis is true is about 0.5. If you fail the smoking gun test, not much changes. It's not really clear what we should say about the posterior probability, other than it's going to be in the vicinity, in the neighborhood of the prior probability. Not much has changed. We haven't learned very much from a fail test here. But with a past smoking gun test, we would say something like the probability, the posterior probability that the hypothesis is true approaches one. Again, no one runs an experiment, looks at the results for a difference of means test, and then says, I'm done. Everyone thinks about what might have gone wrong, and it turns out there's a host of them um, that we won't talk about here. Again, what are the implications for alternative hypotheses? Well, if you pass the smoking gun test, it's not great for the other hypotheses, quite clearly. So, um, uh, although, of course, we can, again, think of uh, uh, different ways of thinking about that as well. All right, let's move on. I'm going to give you an informal introduction to Bayesian process tracing. And Bayesian process tracing is just a way to formally think about the relationship of prior probabilities, posterior probabilities, which you've all already looked at, but also bringing in, taking into account the likelihood of observing the evidence under the assumption of the truth of various hypotheses. Well, how might we think about it? First, if you don't have any exposure to Bayesian inference and you haven't seen the formula, which is a little daunting, and it's on a next slide, remember this. Bayesian inference is the reallocation of credibility among possibilities in light of new information. What does that mean? Well, the way I describe the hoop and smoking gun test to you is that based on whether we considered a test to be a hoop test or a smoking gun test, and based upon the results of that test, we could make some clear statements about the implications for that hypothesis. But it wasn't always clear what the um, implications were for the other hypotheses. Bayesianism is a way to think about each piece of evidence and its implications for all of the hypotheses more or less simultaneously. So it's a it's a it 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 thinks about each hypothesis in light of a piece of evidence, but its implications are spread among all of the hypotheses. And that's what we mean about the reallocation of credibility among possibilities in light of new information. So let me give you a very, very, very simple, informal a way of thinking about this. And this, I think, will help you as you read works that look at this in a more complicated, mathematically complex way. Begin with 10 suspects and no evidence. Your prior probability should follow a uniform distribution. You have no reason with no evidence to think that any of the suspects is more likely to be guilty. So we'll set the prior probability as 0.1. New evidence eliminates one suspect. Ellen was in New York, not in Sweden. She could not have committed the murder, et cetera. The probability that is initially allocated to that suspect, point one, must be reallocated to the remaining nine suspects because the probability distribution has to sum to one. So now that we have eliminated Ellen as a suspect, that prior probability of 0.1 has to be distributed. How would we distribute it? We only have one piece of evidence that exonerates Ellen, um, and therefore we maintain the uniform probability distribution, and we say, all right, now our nine suspects have a posterior probability of 0.11, where posterior just means I've updated the probability in light of new information. Now we start the whole process over. It's iterative. The posterior probability becomes the prior probability. Everyone has a prior probability of 0.11. We find new evidence that eliminates Abdurrahman as a, as a suspect. That 0.1 has to be redistributed now among eight people, and the new posterior is a 12.5%. Uh, and do the math, just keep on dividing one by descending numbers seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And at the end, 
you know, again, and this is a limit of induction in its in in its in its full glory, the posterior probability has to be one. Things don't work so neatly and crisply in the real world, but th there you have it. Here's the formula for a Bayesian process. For a, this is the formula for Bayesian inference, and we and it, it shouldn't be too difficult to think about. Um, how we'd apply this to process tracing, we're still going to look at pieces of evidence. We're going to think about the consequences of that evidence, and this is how we're going to do it. So on the left, we have um, the posterior probability. We've already talked about that. Hopefully you have a, uh, if not an excellent sense of that in, in a basic intuitive in, uh, sense of that. On the right-hand side, we have this fraction in the numerator. We have the prior probability. We've already talked about that. This term um, uh, in the numerator, uh, uh, P of E given H is, and notice we've swapped H and E to be the probability and the condition, is the likelihood of the evidence. How surprising is the evidence under the assumption that the hypothesis is true? And then down on the bottom to scale all of this, we have the probability of the evidence, right? This is the trickiest part of thinking about Bayesianism, but the probability evidence is all the different ways that we could have gotten this evidence, and that means it's the likelihood of the evidence under each of the hypotheses summed together to equal one. So we can at least initially, things can get quite complicated. Um, gosh, I wonder if you can actually read all of my slides if I have your your panel. Oh, I probably should have done that earlier. Oh, whatever. Okay. Um, oh, no, I've done that. Um, uh, think about disaggregating that denominator, the probability of the evidence, into roughly speaking, this is not technically correct, roughly speaking, the probability of the evidence under the assumption that the hypothesis is true and the probability of the evidence under the assumption that the hypothesis is false. And the basic idea here is without going into all the details, evidence that is consistent with the hypothesis is more con convincing if that evidence is unlikely under the assumption that the hypothesis is false or unlikely assuming the truth of any or all of the other alternative hypotheses. That's Bayesian in a nutshell. And again, it allows us to do the same thing, the same detective model of reasoning, the same idea that we're going to um, um, uh, uh, leverage uh, diverse sources of evidence for hypotheses tests. Bayesianism takes this division of tests into these four quadrants, hoop tests, smoking gun tests, et cetera, and says, the lines between them are now arbitrary. So Bayesianism allows us to treat that space. Let me let me go back. Let me make sure you understand this. And if you don't fully understand this, take a class and, and you'll get this quickly. I think this is this is taking a space and dividing it into four quadrants. And Bayesianism just allows us to think about this space as being a continuous space. So that we can have not just probabilities of zero or one, but probabilities of 0.2785, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's, that's what's going on there. Um, let's get back to where I was. Bayesianism is a generalization to a continuous probability space of the detective model of inference. It does very well at working with the, at, at defeating the critique, the small end critique that we've already discussed. Um, it's a great way to think about your hypotheses. It's a great way to think about the likelihood of the evidence under the truth of the hypotheses. It's a great way to do, to think about the implications of a test for all of your hypotheses simultaneously. I endorse it. I have no problem with Bayesian process tracing. Um, I'm sorry now. Uh, what are the limitations of process tracing as I have described it so far? And I hope you see that my, my presentation at this point has been entirely sympathetic and supportive of the very idea of process tracing. It, there's no sense in which I'm critical of process tracing or even a, of these individual ways. Well, first thing to notice is that 
there are many versions of process tracing. And if we have many versions of process tracing, then we have many different standards, not necessarily rival standards, but we have different standards for how we think about a hypothesis in light of evidence. And that means we're going to have different practices. So we have orthodox process tracing, which is the way I first introduced it. We have implicit Bayesian process tracing, which is what Andy Bennett has mostly done. Um, for example, in the chapter I recommended you read, he, 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 he mentions that formula, but at no point does he go through all the steps involved. We have something called explicit Bayesian process tracing. That's sort of the newest flavor on the market. Um, I can give you citations to read on that, or Ellen can give you citations to read on that. Um, uh, and it takes the mathematics of, of Bayesianism very, very seriously. It will ask you to convert your, your odds ratios into logarithms. It will ask you to think in terms of decibels, in terms of how, how, you know, how loud is the evidence, et cetera, and so on and so forth. There's something called sequential process tracing. Um, there's process tracing that does explicitly talk about causal mechanisms. There's process tracing that doesn't talk about causal mechanisms. There's process tracing that rejects the very idea of causal mechanisms. There is unfortunately something I would call nominal process tracing. Scholarship that invokes the term, but if you go and read the work, it will say I'm doing process tracing, which just means they're looking at a single case, but you won't find an explicit statement of a hypothesis. You won't find explicit hypotheses tests. I and some others who work on process tracing have begun to get worried about this, right? Um, finally, this process tracing as theory development, oh, another mistake here, I'm sorry, process tracing as theory development versus process tracing as theory testing. Right? I don't happen to like that distinction. If you develop a theory, you should test it. But someone could say they're doing process tracing, lay out a theory, give you some evidence for it, but never explicitly test it. And when you say, well, why didn't you test it? Their answer could be, well, process tracing in the literature is used for theory development and for theory testing. I'm doing theory development. I don't know what to do with that. I, I simply don't know what to say. I worry in part about conceptual stress, stretching. If too many different things all count as process tracing, the method risks being stripped of all of its valuable substance, and we're left with something like methodological anarchy. It also means some people are going to work really hard and methodically and rigorously to test their hypotheses, call it process tracing, and it's not clear how they claim to have done superior methodologically superior work to someone who just uses the term but doesn't do anything. We don't have enough standards is one way to think about that. All right. Um, the second challenge, um, and I know I've gone on a little bit, I'll try to wrap things up in 15 or 20 minutes. Here's where we're going to get into what I think about things. And you don't, you, you know, you need to know something about process tracing. You don't need to know what I think about things. But I'm here, you're here, we might as well look forward a little bit. If you have read any of the literature on causal inference, you have come up with something against something called the fundamental problem of causal inference. And that's because a causal effect is defined as in equation four, the unit level causal effect is defined as that the outcome for that unit under treatment from which we subtract the outcome for that unit under control. And the difference between those two outcomes, these two measures, will be the difference the cause made. The problem is that we cannot observe a single unit under treatment and under control at the same time. We can observe one or the other, but not both. And therefore, we cannot do this very simple act of subtraction. This is properly understood as a problem of missing data, that either the outcome under treatment or the outcome under control will be a counterfactual. And therefore, every method of causal inference, experimental or quantitative, is making causal claims through a research design that justifies the assumption of exchangeability between units under treatment and units under control. And what exchangeability means is that on average, units under treatment have the same 
potential outcome under as units under control. And therefore we can use the observation of units under control as a proxy measure of the what the outcomes would have been for units under treatment had they been assigned to control. And that's how you get around the fundamental problem of causal inference. Obviously this is quite complicated. It requires a certain number of assumptions, some of which might be less plausible than others, et cetera. But the point is the fundamental problem of causal inference says you can't do unit level causal effect. And that's kind of a problem because if you think about what we've been saying about the detective model of inference, the detective model of inference is taking, making a causal inference based on a single unit. That's the whole point. So what do I think about this? I think the detective model of inference is an absolutely satisfactory response to the small n critique. I also think that for a lot of people who do process tracing, once they had a response to the small n critique, they stopped caring about the literature on causal inference. They stopped caring about experimentalists and they stopped caring about people doing quantitative work. Just thinking we have met their critique, they're doing one thing, we're doing something else, we don't have to listen to them anymore. I've been saying this for many years that, there's a, that we have to be able to respond to the fundamental problem of causal inference. And I'm gonna tell you, no, no one has, has picked up the banner with me, which leads me to say that process tracing is conventionally understood implicitly would have to consider the detective model of inference as a satisfactory response to the fundamental problem of causal inference as well. That the detective model would have to work against the small end critique and against the fundamental problem of causal inference. I think that this implicit belief is a risky epistemic wager. I'm not confident that the detective model of inference works as a satisfactory response to the fundamental problem of causal inference. My wager, and again, it's a wager, I have to try to work everything out and convince people that I've got this right, is that a better approach would synthesize the detective model of inference with the literature on causal inference. So what would we do? We'd maintain the detective model of inferences um, idea of assessing the relative consistency of hypotheses with diverse sources of evidence. We wouldn't move over to a structure of uh, the analysis of covariance, but we would pay explicit attention to causal structures. What do I mean by this? The last seven slides, as you see, are really my working out this, the, the implications of this last couple of words, paying explicit attention to different causal structures. Here's a causal structure. And what is this? This is, this is what we'll introduce as a causal model or a causal graph. And the causal graph is saying to us that X is a cause of Y, that there are alternative hypotheses that are also potential causes of Y, and that X generates a piece of evidence that we're going to call smoking gun evidence. In this scenario, observation of the smoking gun evidence is sufficient to conclude that X is a cause of Y, not the alternative hypotheses. And if you think about this, if you go to your doctor and you describe your symptoms and maybe the doctor does some one or more diagnostic tests, this is actually what they're doing. The diagnostic test becomes more or less smoking gun evidence, more or less because I'm sure you all know that any diagnostic test has a possibility of a false positive and a possibility of a false negative. Again, that's why Bayesian inference is the proper way to think about this. And the doctor is able to reason backwards from the diagnostic test, assuming it's a true positive, to an underlying condition. This is done all the time in, in medicine. But note, this is not really a question of causal inference per se, because we have well-established knowledge of what the causes of various conditions are, whether they're germs or genetic mutations or something. We have well-developed diagnostic tests. It's just a matter of applying the test and reasoning backwards. If this is the underlying causal structure, then the detective model of inference works very well. And I have no objection to it. 
The problem is we don't know if this is the underlying causal structure. For example, what if this is the causal structure? Let's look on the top panel here. On the top panel, again, we have alternative hypotheses that could be considered causes of Y. We have something called Z that could be a cause of Y. And then notice that Z causes X and X causes the smoking gun evidence. So we observe the smoking gun evidence and we want to conclude from that, again, we'll be Bayesians and, and make a probability statement that X is a cause of Y. The problem is from the underlying causal structure, and of course, this is a hypothetical exa uh, example, X is not a cause of Y. X, the relationship between X and Y is spurious. And the only reason we see a relationship between X and Y is because Z is a cause of X and Z is a cause of Y. The smoking gun evidence has led us astray. We can do a slightly more complicated version of that in the bottom panel, once again, we have alternative hypotheses as a potential cause of Y. Once again, we have smoking gun evidence caused by X and therefore um, implying that X is the cause. Once again, Z is a cause of X, but Z notice is also a cause of Y by a separate and distinct path looping over the top that does not pass through X. In the literature, we would call the, the path from X to Z to Y, a backdoor path. And note that the path from X to Z to Y is not a causal path because the, the, the segment from X to Z goes in the opposite direction of the true causal relationship. The detective model of inference will give false positives under many causal structures. That's what we have to worry about. And as currently constructed, the reason I emphasize the detective model of inference is because if you go back and think about it, it's simply saying, I'm going to test these hypotheses against the evidence. And there's nothing in it that asks us to think about underlying causal structures. But everything about the causal inference literature says, hey, you should think about causal structures. So that's where I want to try to bring about a... Uh, well, a synthesis. I mean, we've been talking about doing syntheses, et cetera. Just a bit of graph theory. I don't know if you need all of this. If you do, it won't be enough. But if you know it already, bear with me. On the top, we have just the simplest possible graph. I call it an atomic graph, X arrow Y. X and Y in graph theory are called nodes or vertices, and these represent random variables. The arrow itself is a directed edge. Right, You could have an edge without the arrowhead, which wouldn't connote um, any direction of influence. But the fact that we put the arrow in there from X to Y represents our belief that any probabilistic dependence of Y on X, that is to say, if by changing the value of X, we change the value of Y, would be because X is a cause of Y. I'm sorry, if we observe probabilistic dependence of Y on X means if we observe the value of X changing, then we would observe the value of Y changing. That is not necessarily a causal relationship, but the fact that we put the arrow there, we, we could say we're hypothesizing this, we're stipulating this, or we could have well-established well causal knowledge and simply believe that to be true. I want you to note that the graph explicitly states that X is a cause of Y. But one of the great things about graphs is they implicitly say a whole lot more. What does the graph say? Y is not a cause of X. There are no pretreatment common causes. There are no pretreatment sources of exogenous variation, if you know about instrumental variable analysis. There are no mediators, M, on the path between X and Y. And there are no other variables, W, you can think of these as alternative hypotheses, although in the book, I explain why that's the wrong way to th think about them. So I'm gonna give you a you know five or 10 minute peek at what I do. The book, I'm hoping the book comes out in, by the middle of 2025. It's got an enormous amount of detail. I start from the position that we have to know something about the overall causal structure. And because we don't know, we should start from this graph on the slide here. And the reason I want to start with this graph because is because it's in effect the worst possible graph.
because it has three potential sources of bias. Any evidence we come up with about X could be biased in three ways. First, there could be bias along the front door path. And the front door path would be mediators between X and Y. And I've there placed a question mark because we don't know anything about mediators. Remember, I started out by saying, I think of process tracing as allowing us to trace a continuous causal process. If we don't know the mediators, we can't make a claim about a continuous causal process. So this potential bias along the front door path. Second, this potential bias along the back door path. Again, that's the path that runs from X to Z to Y. And it's a non-causal path because the, the segment from X to Z runs against the direction of the, of the arrow. So that's a second source of bias. There could also be bias along the side door path which is the path from W to Y. Um, and front door and back door are in the literature on causal graphs. Side door is my contribution. And in the book, I explain in much more detail why we have to worry about the side door path. Um, if there are causes in this vector W that are orthogonal to X, but causes of Y, that means that Y is changing its value independent of the, the causal effect of X. And that means one very specific thing. We can no longer use the pre-treatment value of Y as a proxy measure of what Y would look like under the counterfactual of control. And therefore we have no way of speaking to the fundamental problem of causal inference. Put differently, we can't observe why under treatment and under control simultaneously. We can observe why prior to the causal effect of X and after the causal effect of X. And that in principle gives us a measure of why under control, the earlier observation, and why under treatment, the later observation. Unfortunately, we have to add the assumption that Y doesn't change for any reason other than X. Well, if there are um, variables or causes in this vector W, that means that Y is changing for reasons having nothing to do with X. And that means we can no longer use the pre-treatment value of Y as a proxy measure of the post-treatment value of Y counterfactually under control. That's a mouthful, I know, but I'm just giving you an idea that there are three potential sources of bias. And then our job is not just to consider evidence per se, our job is to check and see whether we can get rid of these sources of bias. So what would that mean? Ideally, and I wanna say ideally, I'm not saying you're gonna reach this conclusion, right? A method just tells you what steps to take. It doesn't guarantee any outcome. You can run a well-designed experiment and still get a zero causal effect, either because there is no causal effect or because you got really unlucky in your draw. Ideally, we would conclude that the correct causal graph has causal continuity, continuity along the front door path. That means we have accounted for all the necessary mediators. Second, and again, ideally, we would conclude that the set of pretreatment common causes is an empty set. That means if Z is an empty set, there cannot be bias along the backdoor path because bias along the backdoor path requires that there be a Z. Third, we would conclude that the set of orthogonal causes is also an empty set. And that would yet allow us to use the pretreatment value of Y as a proxy measure for the missing counterfactual of Y under control. That's the ideal world. I'm not telling you you get that because I don't know if that's true. Remember, we don't know what the true causal structure of the world is. Whether or not you reach the ideal depends upon what the world looks like and what we can infer about the world given our evidence. So this is a statement about a standard. It's not a statement that says, follow my procedures and you get this standard. 
what would the standard look like? The previous slide, the previous graph had bias from Z, bias from W, and bias from the absence of um, mediators. In this slide, moving from left to right, the first node is I in this fancy font, and that's what I like to call an ideal intervention. And an ideal intervention is something that influences X but doesn't influence Y by any other path that doesn't pass through X. It could be random assignment. It could be a naturally occurring random assignment. It could be an instrument in the standard econometric sense of the world word of an exogenous source of variation. All we're saying is we can account for X by a prior variable that does not induce any bias. Third, there's no W. We have ruled it out by carefully considering all the potential Ws, right? We're still procedurally using the detective model of inference. And that means that there's no bias along the front door path, there's no bias along the back door path, and there's no bias along the side door path, which is another way of saying we can use the pre-treatment cause pre-treatment status of Y as a measure, as a proxy measure of the counterfactual post-treatment status of Y under control, because the only cause of Y is X itself. Otherwise, Y would have remained unchanged. That's still a lot of assumptions, right? This is not an assumption-free model. We're assuming we know all the mediators. We're assuming Z is an empty set. We're assuming W is an empty set. When I say assume, I'm not saying, hey, I think I'll make this assumption because that allows me to go out and get drunk tonight and still get publications out of it. We're saying you've done the work as best you can using the standard tools of the detective model of inference to justify these assumptions. Whether we could arrive at this ideal outcome depends upon the causal structure of the world, which is unknown to us and the availability of evidence. But note that unlike the detective model, here we're explicitly talking about the causal structure of the world. Second, even if we did not arrive at this ideal conclusion, which is a pretty high standard, there is much we learn about the causal structure of the world and many things we can do to deal productively with bias. That there might be some bias in our claims is not the end of the world. There's all sorts of things we've learned and all sorts of ways to think about how to manage that bias. Finally, the number one critique I've received again and again and again, the standard is too high. Honestly, I think that's a ridiculous critique. The standard is what it is. If you agree on the logical basis of the standard, then it's not too high or too low, it just is. If you think the way I derive the standard is wrong, then the fact that the standard is high is immaterial, it's the wrong standard. You can go ahead and ignore the standard. You could do things the way everything, you know, work that just does standard garden variety process tracing gets published. There are very few works of explicit Bayesian process tracing, but there are thousands of publications calling themselves process tracing. I'm not going to stand in your way, but you've got this in the back of your mind, and I hope you at least lose some sleep over it. The standard is high, but work that fails to meet the standard is not a failure. And if we ignore the standard, the only alternative is to embrace the possibility of an unknown number of false positives. For example, all the work that says the medieval Middle East was just dysfunctional, by my standard, becomes wrong insofar as that work is used to claim that the contemporary Middle East and its problems were caused by the medieval Middle East. That work is wiped out by my standard because it can't establish continuity along the front door path. I've just given you some terminology for what the problem is. So if you want to ignore the possibility of false positives, you're, you're in large and esteemed company. But now you know the possibilities of something else. The detective model of inference attempts to eliminate alternative hypotheses by considering the consistency of evidence and hypotheses.
QCI is a little bit different. The way, the quickest way I can describe it is QCI attempts to eliminate alternative causal structures. They're both going to use evidence. They're both going to use evidence to test hypotheses. But my hypotheses aren't just what's everything I can think about that might have been a cause of why. My evidence is, my hypotheses are about mediators along the front door path, elements of Z that are pretreatment common causes of X and Y, and elements of W that are causes of Y that are orthogonal to X. So I treat alternative hypotheses very, very differently. QCI and the detective model of inference will reach similar conclusions just in case that M, Z, and W are in reality all empty sets. I think that's quite possible. I'm not ruling it out. I think a lot of studies of foreign policy decision-making probably follow that model. The difference is that while QCI designs check for that conclusion, the detective model of inference assumes it. Therefore, even under the case that QCI and detective model of inference give the exact same answer, QCI always yields more information about the world because it tells you that M, Z, and W are empty, while the detective model simply kind of honestly, without giving it sufficient thought, assumes that. There are other benefits of QCI. Here's where I'll stop. Heuristic. QCI compels scholars to grapple with explicitly causal questions, not just the consistency of evidence and hypothesis. In a nutshell, a huge part of QCI forces you to answer the question, I observe, I observe X has a particular value, I observe Y, what would happen if I intervened on X to set it to that value rather than just observed it having that value? In this thought experiment, what do I know about the effects of intervention? And that's a causal inference question. That's about the effects of causes. Second, communication. QCI allows qualitativists to speak the same language as others. I, I tell students, imagine you go to Rochester. On the one hand, you can talk to them about hoop tests or smoking gun tests, or you can say, I'm gonna demonstrate to you that I have continuity along the front door path and the back door path is closed and the set W is an empty set. I just think that gives us a tremendous number of advantages. Finally, a last point, not gonna develop it here. It's the last part of the book. QCI produces better explanations than any other method, but that's chapters eight and nine of the book and those are still under, under construction. Thank you very much for listening, for putting up with the um, rather lengthy technical problems. QCI is a non-technical method, so you don't have to worry about those sorts of problems, be deviling you if you use it.